If you've watched mine or many other people's full self-driving videos, or if you've had the chance to try out full self-driving 12.3.3 on your own in your Tesla in North America, you'll know that these Teslas are driving amazingly. In fact, they're getting to the point where they're almost as good as humans. But what happens if you wanna go beyond humans? What if you want to be better than every human at driving? This is actually quite problematic and Andre Carpathy indirectly has something to say about that. So let's take a look and let's speculate a bit. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. Like I said in the intro, this is going to be highly speculative. I'm just doing this based on my own understanding of things. I don't have any inside information from Tesla, so I, I want to start with that. But Andre Carpathy did work at Tesla for quite a while before he was at OpenAI. Famously, he built their AI full self-driving division from scratch, basically, and so he actually knows quite a bit about what Tesla's doing. In the clip I'm about to show, Andre is ostensibly talking about large language models, but I think this actually works for full self-driving as well. And a big shout out to AI Explained who actually cut up the clip a lot and kind of shortened it up to make it a little bit more digestible. So thanks to him, I'll leave a link to his video in the description. You should definitely subscribe. It is an excellent channel, so I highly recommend it. Anyway, let's take a listen to this clip that starts at around the nine minute and 30 second mark. Because the current models are just like not good enough. And I think there are big rocks to be turned here. And I think people still haven't like really seen what's possible in the space, uh, like at all. And I, like roughly speaking, I think we've done step one of AlphaGo. We've done imitation learning part. Uh, there's step two of AlphaGo, which is the RL. And uh, people haven't done that yet. And I think it's going to fundamentally, like this is the part that actually made it work and made something superhuman. But I think this is, it, we just haven't done step two of AlphaGo, long story short. And we've just done imitation. And I don't think that people appreciate like, number one, like how terrible the data collection is for things like ChatGPT. Say you're, you have a problem, like some prompt is some kind of a mathematical problem. A human comes in and gives the ideal solution, right? to that problem. The problem is that the human psychology is different from the model psychology. What's easy or hard for the, mo for the human are different to what's easy or hard for the model. And so human kind of fills out some kind of a trace that like comes to the solution, but like some parts of that are trivial to the model and some parts of that are a massive leap that the model doesn't understand. You're kind of just like losing it and then everything else is polluted by that later. And so like fundamentally what you need is the model, my, uh, the model needs to practice itself uh, how to solve these problems. It needs to figure out what works for it or does not work for it. But it needs to learn that for itself based on its own capability and its own knowledge. So that's number one is like, that's totally broken, I think. It's a good initializer though, for something agent-like. And then the other thing is like, we're doing reinforcement learning from human feedback, but that's like a super weak form of reinforcement learning. It doesn't even count as reinforcement learning, I think. So RLHF is like nowhere near, I would say RL, this is like silly. And the other thing is imitation learning, super silly. RLHF is nice improvement, but it's still silly. And I think people need to look for better ways of training these models so that it's in the loop with itself and its own psychology. And I think we're, uh, there will probably be unlocks in that direction. Okay, so there is a lot to unpack here. I want to start with psychology here. This is really interesting to, see, to hear Andre talk about this. And again, you can hear him talking about large language models and stuff like that. So ostensibly, that's what he's talking about, but I'm gonna tie this into full self-driving here. But basically what he's saying is that things that are easy for humans are not necessarily easy for these neural networks. And you would say computers in general, right? We're not very good at holding large numbers in our head and multiplying them together and stuff, whereas computers are great at that. Of course, neural networks are not like that at all. They're much more more like a human brain, but still things are quite different. There were classic examples back in the early days, like 10 years ago, it seems seems like forever ago at this point, but looking at ImageNet and classifying images and classifying, I remember a specific paper talking about wolves versus dogs and how the classifier was really, really good at classifying between wolves and dogs. And people are like, wow, look at that, that's amazing. But then people started throwing in images of them playing in the yard with their dog in the snow. And all of a sudden the classifier was classifying them as wolves. Well, it turned out the classifier had not looked at the dog at all. It had looked at the image and any image that had snow in it, it was like, oh, that's likely to be a wolf. So it wasn't paying any attention to the mammal that's the center of the picture. It was looking at the background. It was looking at the snow and that was its determinant factor. So, you know, that was early days and people have figured out things since then. But the problem with that is that the psychology, the brain of the neural network is not the brain of a human. And we make a big mistake if we think those two things are matched up. So what Andre is saying is that the solution to this is reinforcement learning or some type of agentic learning that is not tied to humans. So in the case of large language models, you're looking at a situation where you've got human language, right? Trillions of tokens out there, trillions of words on the internet. You scoop them together. You do this train 
training run. And basically you're doing imitation learning at that point. You're saying imitate people, right? And that's the whole point of what large language models do. It's like, I'm gonna give you this half of a sentence, tell me what the next word is, and I'm gonna tell you if you're right or wrong based on what the next actual word was in the sentence that that person had written. Well, that's it's good and it works okay, but it's pretty darn weak. It will only get you up to a certain point because there are many, many different, there's infinite possibilities of combinations of these words and imitating individual humans is not going to get you all the way there. Now, again, if you look at millions and billions of sentences, the, the computer is actually amazing. It's, it's pretty impressive that it's able to pattern recognize from this and figure out the likely statistical next word from that imitation learning. But generative pre-trained transformers, the, the foundation model is not good at replicating human speech, which is where RLHF comes in, which is what Andre also talks about, reinforcement learning with human feedback. That is famously like that it will generate two answers and the person picks the one they like the best or something. So there's a small amount of human feedback that comes in that trains this foundation model that spent a long, long time learning on its own just from doing all this autoregressive training by blocking out words and it has to figure out the next word. Then you layer on top of that. So that's imitation learning because it's imitating humans. But then on top of that, you have to add reinforcement learning with human feedback. You have to add humans saying, I like this answer better than this answer. This sounds more natural. That is very labor intensive, very slow, very cumbersome. And Andre is saying it's very, very weak. It's not that useful. And the comparison he's drawing is to AlphaGo versus AlphaZero. So AlphaGo, the thing that actually beat Lee Sedol back in 2015, I believe, or 2016. Anyway, when that happened, it was a bit, it was a big milestone because it was like the hardest game that humans knew how to play. And it was considered to be impossible for an artificial intelligence to learn. And yet it did. And it beat the best player in the world at the time. That was hand tuned, a lot of heuristic code, DeepMind did incredible work with that. But then they built Alpha Zero that did reinforcement learning. It basically just trained on itself. It had two players or something along those lines and they just played each other. They had the basic rules, but they didn't know anything else. And within a very short time, I think it was just a matter of weeks, it was way, way better than Alpha Go. It, it, was, it was able to defeat it basically 100 out of 100 games because it got so much better. So the original version of Alpha Go had done imitation learning. It had studied all the games, you know, the write-ups of the games. It had looked through those games. It had tried to play them itself and all of that kind of stuff. And it had basically imitated humans and it had learned how to be the best human player. But when you suddenly release this thing from humans, when you release it to reinforce itself on its own, to kind of play itself, to learn its own psychology, learn the rules of the game on its own. When you get to that point, suddenly this thing gets way better than humans. And it's, it's something where humans now look at these alpha zero games and they actually learn stuff that no human in all of Go history had known how to do before. They're like, look at that move. That is a really beautiful sequence of moves that nobody even had, had thought to do in all of human history, right? That's the kind of thing that we're looking at. So we're talking about superhuman Go ability. And Andre is saying you need to release large language models from this weak reinforcement learning procedure of doing RLHF. In fact, he's actually saying it needs to not be reinforcement learning at all. It needs to be something else. He doesn't apparently have an answer, although he might. <laughs> Maybe it's in secret that he's working on that. But at the very least, the reinforcement learning that, that can go on with a large language model, when you take away the need for human-generated text, when it can generate its own text, and it can figure out whether that's good text or not, all of that kind of stuff can allow a large language model to get to superhuman writing ability or textual communication ability. And of course, you might start to see where full self-driving is going to tie into this. But first of all, we have to deal with the devil in the room. And that is regression to the mean. What does that mean? That means if you do this in a simple way. So let's say we have ChatGPT generate some sort of text, right? And then we utilize that to train the next version of ChatGPT. So we bring it into the model and we train on that. And then we keep adding more and more and more synthetic text until all we have is synthetic text that to train the next version. So ChatGPT4 generates all the text to train ChatGPT5. And then ChatGPT5 generates all the text for ChatGPT6 and 7, et cetera. The danger is that these are statistical models. What they do is they look for, you know, you, you look for a Gaussian curve, right? You're looking for something that's like a bell curve. And you're like, oh, this is the most likely word right here that I would pick out next. The 
problem is that you can start regressing. You get rid of all the beautiful stuff, right? One of the things that's beautiful about language is that when, you know, Shakespeare pulls a crazy word out of the air, for example, delve. <laughs> Interestingly enough, you can look at science papers and if they have a lot of word delves in there, D-E-L-V-E, -E, then you can determine that it's probably ChatGPT because for whatever reason, it's locked onto that word and it thinks it's very likely. But that we can take that as an example, but basically it can start throwing out other possibilities of a word in that situation and just keep hitting the same word over and over again. So it's basically regressing itself. It's losing the ability to go out and get weird statistical outliers in terms of language and just continuing to kind of close the envelope down. And it will get kind of dumber and dumber. It'll get less and less interesting at generating language. That is a huge problem. Regression to the mean is the big thing that people have to take account of. Now, clearly these companies, they're not really telling us exactly how they're doing this, but they're making some sort of headway against this by doing reinforcement learning and still injecting enough noise or enough interesting stuff in here that these systems can learn on their own with their own synthetic data without needing human data or human feedback ultimately. So this is obviously still an ongoing area of research in large language models. And we're gonna see probably some of the results of that with, with ChatGPT5 and whatever the next generation of competing products are, we're going to see that start to take place. So how does this tie back into full self-driving? Well, full self-driving right now up to this point, and again, we don't know because we haven't had Tesla AI data in a couple of years. But the last clue that we had was it was imitation learning solely. So what it was doing was sucking in a ton of data about good human drivers, right? They curate the data very carefully. So they don't take the crappy human drivers, they take the good ones. And they pull in those people's data and they look at how they drive. And then the, the neural network is training itself to imitate them. So this is very, very analogous to the original AlphaGo. Now it's not analogous because they did a bunch of hand, hand tuning and heuristics and all that kind of stuff with AlphaGo. But the basic procedure with AlphaGo was to imitate humans. It looked at human games and it figured out how human beings played, the best humans played, and it learned how to play from that input source. So, so same thing as far as we know at this point, full self-driving is learning how to drive from the best human drivers. What that means is the best possibility of full self-driving under that regime of training of only imitation with reinforcement is to be as good as the best human drivers. But what if we want to go to the next step? <laughs> what if we want this thing to be better? Now, number one, it is just going to be better because it's not going to get you know distracted. It's not going to look down at its phone. It's not going to get tired. It's not going to go out drinking and you know drive home so even the best drivers you know under some circumstances will not be the best drivers so that can make full self driving better than the best human driver because it will never, it'd be like the best human driver that's always right on it, that's really, really paying attention. But how do we make it even better? What if we want it to be 10 times better than the best human driver? We can no longer do imitation learning because humans can only drive so well. That's the best we can do. So again, analogously with AlphaGo versus AlphaZero, AlphaZero, when it did its own psychology, when it learned how to play on its own, it was able to play so much better than humans that humans watch, look at the games, they look at the trace of the games and they learn new things like excellent you know, Go players, excellent human Go players actually have learned how to play the game differently based on Alpha Zero. And that was all based on two Alpha agents that played each other. They kept playing, 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 and whoever would win, you know, that would be reinforcement and whoever lost, that would be de-reinforcement or whatever. So they learned to play each other. And you can tie that into what Tesla might be starting to do now. It's, it's possible they're doing this already. It's possible they will do this in the future. Don't know. But in order to make the car drive, let's say 10 times or 100 times better, than the best human driver. And we don't even really know what that means because we're locked in ourselves. We're like, oh, that's a good driver. But that person might suck compared to what a computer that's 10 or 100 times better than the best human driver is. So we don't even know. So you kind of have to start from scratch with sort of a synthetic data landscape. You pull in the imitation stuff, you get the car driving up to a certain level and then throw it into a virtual world. And we know that Tesla has an excellent ability to simulate reality down to incredible detail. So what you could do is you could create these virtual full self-driving agents that go into these simulated worlds, use the information from all the human drivers to reconstruct this reality very, very, very tightly, and then put these agents into this world and let them compete with each other in some sense. You could have, you know, two of these things and it's like, okay, which one does better? And whichever one succeeds in driving a better route, more safety, more comfort, less time, less energy expended. Scott and I actually were talking about that when I was out walking the dogs yesterday. You know,
know, maybe you could add that into it too. If you could save 1% on your battery charge because you drove a little bit better, that would ultimately have a gigantic effect because you would get a lot of money back, a lot of energy back at the end of the year because the car was driving just that little bit better. So again, you know, it can have a bunch of factors in mind, but these things could compete against each other in these virtual arenas and whoever wins keeps bumping up and inside those synthetic worlds, they can get better and better and better. And then you can go out and test them in reality. And you can use those tests to both update your virtual arena to make it more accurate to the real world, but also to validate these full self-driving outcomes and see if they're getting better and better and, and beyond the, the best human driver. And of course, by letting them train on their own, you're letting them develop their own psychology, as Andre says. You're letting them deal with a situation, create their own reality in their own way, not trying to imitate what a human is doing. And that will really free them from just being imitators of humans to being something different, to being able to do something in a different way than humans do it, and potentially much, much, much better, orders of magnitude better than the best human. And just to tie this back in, I wanna bring up a post from Gnome Brown, and this was deleted, so this was recently posted on 329.24, but then pulled down, he currently works for OpenAI. He said, you don't get superhuman performance by doing better imitation learning on human data. So he is reinforcing that idea. There is a rumor that he might have something to do with QSTAR, which if you haven't seen my videos on that, definitely check those out. But he posted that and then took it down, so a little bit mysterious about that. But he is reinforcing the idea that you don't want to do just imitation of human beings. You don't want to do reinforcement learning just using human data as the ground truth. You want to allow these things to become agents and play each other in some sort of synthetic world. How do you deal with regression to the mean? That is an interesting question. In full self-driving, it might not be as much of an issue either. And that's the interesting part. Because one of the cool things about language is we want flowery language. We want unexpected bon mot, right? So throw out a little French there to be unexpected. But with full self-driving, we may not actually want that craziness. But then again, we've been seeing some posts of full self-driving 12.3.x doing things like driving up on curbs, taking detours, going around construction sites onto dirt roads and things like that. And by the way, Scott, nice job of getting Ashok to actually respond to you. That was very cool. I'm gonna do a video about that. I promised Scott I would leave that alone, but stay tuned, we'll be doing that very, very shortly. But anyway, these are the edge cases and you could consider them to be the flowery word equivalent, right? They're the things, the unexpected words. These are situations in reality where you have unexpected things happen and the car is able to handle those unexpected things things. So somehow they are dealing with this regression to the mean issue. That will, of course, continue to be a bigger and bigger problem if they go for more and more synthetic data for training. But again, there are ways of mitigating that. And I'm sure Tesla's got a lot of very smart people working on that. So anyway, hopefully they will be able to keep it from regressing back to the mean and becoming kind of stupider as it trains more and more on synthetic data. And remember, I'm just speculating on this, but assuming that it trains more and more on synthetic data, you have to deal with that. But if they're able to deal with that, we could could within a not very long time, now that Tesla is no longer compute constrained so much, we could be looking at within a few months to a year of cars that are driving demonstrably better than the best human driver, even on their best day. And at the same time, if Andre Carpathy is right, we could be looking at large language models that are better at writing and better at communicating through writing and spoken language than the best human writers and communicators. So this is going to open up a very weird and wild new world, and it's a very exciting new world, especially for driving. Again, I don't like to drive. I would much prefer that my car would just drive me where I need to go and I could sleep or I could work or I could look at X posts on my phone, whatever it is. So it's an exciting world, particularly for driving. If if Tesla can really solve this problem. And I'm very much looking forward to what the future holds. All right, so let me know what you think in the comments. And while you're down there, please like and subscribe. And finally, a big shout out to Star, or as we all know and love you, Rob's mom on your birthday. Happy birthday. And in the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.